Good morning, Georgia. My name is Mario Bolivar. <coughs> These are my friends, and today we continue reading the book of 1 Timothy. Today we are on chapter 4. Um, we meet every Tuesday to read the Bible, to have um, light discussions, to try to learn and see how we can apply the text. Today we arrive to a powerful <coughs> chapter where Paul is warning Timothy uh, in itself about false teachers and about the good God who became a servant um, to lead us all the way. Um, that being said, let me begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather and the opportunity to read your scriptures. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather with brothers and sisters in faith and to be able to read the scripture together. Open our eyes and open our hearts, oh gracious Father, for the beginning and the learning of your love in the world. Amen. All right. So I am going to show you what we are going to be reading. All right, the New Living Translation is on the left. The New International Version is on the right. Uh, I will read from verse... 1 to 10, and um, Ruth will read from 11 to the end. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods. But God created those foods to be eaten with things by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. For we know it is made acceptable by the word of God and prayer. If you explain these things to brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and the good teaching you have followed. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and all wise tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physically, training is good, but training for godliness is much better promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you receive through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your task so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. This is a word inspired by God for us, the children of God. Let us pray. Lord, Help us retain that which is good and let go of that which is not healthy. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to read the scripture, open our hearts and our minds for the understanding of it and the application of it. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Amen. All right. So, so far in the first three chapters, 
the Apostle Paul have done three things. This is the intro for you. Paul has spoken about the law, grace, and salvation, the three pillars of our faith from chapter 1, verse 3, to about chapter 2, verse 7. Then Paul talks and addresses Timothy, helping him to understand church behavior and leadership. He does this from chapter 2, verse 8, to chapter 3, verse 13. Church behavior and church leadership. Now, and at the heart of the letter, almost at the middle of the letter, Paul teaches um, Timothy what is at the center of the proper perspective for Christians. That's chapter 3, verse 14 and 16. Can somebody read chapter 3, verse 14 to 16 of First Timothy? Just so you guys can remember what he says. Uh, 14 to 16 or 13 to 16? 14, 13, and 16. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. 14 to all the way to 16. So four, four verses. 14, 15, 16. Okay, 14. The great mystery. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. That four chapters, or um, I guess three chapters, if I get my math right. Three verses. Is, is the center of the whole letter of Timothy. Our faith is not by knowing, but by believing in the mystery of Christ. And at the beginning of verse 13, uh, 14, you know that it is Paul saying that <clears throat> I want you to entertain the idea that it is the spirit of God, the word that became flesh, saying that to us, the church. Verse 14 says what, Dave, again? Verse 13? Verse 14. 14. Oh, oh, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. That. You have to know that Paul was and had evidence that Christ was coming quickly at that time. Paul had every indication that Christ was going to come while he was alive. And he was saying to the church that in the same way he was going to come to the, to the church to be with them. Now, obviously, for God, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. So time for God is not the same as us. Obviously, Paul believed that Christ was going to come, and so he was in a rush, making sure that the churches knew the true gospel right away. And that is the right way, the frame of mind that we should have as Christians. We should hurry up and wait. So also, a little bit of military stuff there, but hurry up and wait. Be diligent and wait. Do what you must and wait because you simply don't know when Jesus comes back again. He will come back. And so because of the knowledge, he has given us homework to do. So while many of us get busy trying to understand what it is, what we must do, let's not lose the sight of what we know we must do. Let me say it another way because that's that way may be confusing. There's a lot of mystery in our faith. But what are the things that we know are true without any hesitation as Christians?
Well, that Christ died for our sins, and if I accept him, then I will have salvation. That's a truth, and if you don't believe that, you are not a Christian. You have to believe that Christ, the historical Christ, existed. You have to believe beyond any doubt that Christ existed and died. And you have to believe beyond any doubt that Christ existed, died, and resurrected. If you don't believe that, you cannot be a Christian. Those are definite truths. If you don't believe that, that means that Christ died in vain. And God will not put up with that. Now, outside of that, what are some of the other things that you know are true <laughs> beyond any doubt? Things that well, the Spirit has spoken to you directly. God loves we, we, me. Say that again. God loves me. God loves you. Yes. God loves you. But because God loves you, that's evidence that God loves who, who else? Everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. so because god loves you god loves your brother and sister so you must behave act cooperate in the knowledge that god loves you and the person next to you equally how will that change your mind if you know that when you do something wrong and you are misbehaving or you are doing something to hurt someone how would that make sense in the knowledge that god loves you and the other person the same now i'm not talking about grace which is revealed and given in different amounts as each person needs i'm talking about love Grace is given in different portions as people need it. But love, love is given to all. Since Christ died for all. And the, and, the, and the other part of that equation is that we are created to love God. So if my we love are, for God are, is great say, enough. Craig, I will change the word. We are conditioned to love God. We have given everything possible. We have that, been conditioned to do that. But that is also our purpose on earth is to love God. Yes. And though by loving God, you love the person sitting next to you. That's the first commandment, to love God above all else and to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to love your neighbor. You have to love God. And from this commandment, all the other commandments come. Now, if we're going to go and consider the text from today, verse 1 says that the Holy Spirit clearly tells us that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. Now, let me ask you again, what is the true faith? It is not being Methodist, it's not being Baptist, it's not being Presbyterian. That all, those are the ways where we practice things, but that is not true faith. What is a true faith? Is exactly what they said, that Christ existed, that Christ died, that Christ resurrected. And that God asks us to love God above all else and to love neighbor as ourselves. That is at the heart of everything. The center of what we should not have any hesitation. You can doubt everything except that. And he tells us that in the last times, what last times? We don't know what. If they are talking about the tribulation time or they're talking about the Christ coming, we don't know in what area of the last times, because there are different last times, last times on earth, last times of tribulation, last times when the thousand years come. We don't know precisely what last times they are referring to. But we know 
without any doubt, that some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. What do we think a demon is? Red, green, horns, multiple eyes, evil, nasty, disgusting. No. Demons are those people like you and me who do the devil's bitten. What do I say by that? All right. Let's pay attention to Mark 7. Mark? Mark 7, 14 to 25. All right. Give me a second. All right. In there, you will see a familiar story that you should be familiar with. It's about Peter and Jesus. When they are in the land of perdition, near the hole where they used to sacrifice children and women. All right. Let us pay attention to verse Mark 7, chapter 7, um, <clears throat> you said 14? Yes, beginning on 14. Would you go ahead and, and read it, Dave? When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, the disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, <clears throat> are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man from, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Right there. All right. All that thought on how significant it is not what you are consuming. And we're not just talking about food here, and I hope that you see that. We're not talking about, we're talking about information. We're talking about study. We're talking about relationships. It is not what you consume, it is what comes out of you. Now, now that you know this and you remember this, let us go to Matthew 16. What verse? Matthew 16, verse 21, 23, 23. Verse 21, Matthew 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. And what is in Jerusalem? The, chief, the temple. His death. <laughs> His death. The cross. He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the leadership of the church, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day he be raised to life. 
But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. What does Jesus reply? Get behind me, Satan. In that moment, my friends, Peter is a demon. Peter doesn't want the Lord Jesus to do what he came to do. Why? Because of self-preservation, because of friendship, because of love. And how many of us stop doing what we must do because of other reasons? I'm going to be late. That doesn't help. It's too expensive. You know, just yesterday, just yesterday, someone, we were gathering for prayer and someone was at the doorstep of the church, young lady, 25, 30, sleeping. She looked like she had not been out on the streets a long time. And I say that is because I look at her feet and her nails were done. No person in the streets has her nails done. And I'm paying attention to her feet and her nails are done and she has flip-flops. Shoes are not made for walking, at least not a great distance. And I see that she is sleepy and she just has a small bag of clothing and a handbag. Her hair is done, but it's messy, dirty. At some point, you know, Actually, George was there with me. We, we greeted her. We welcomed into the church. She sat down. Believe it or not, she stayed for the whole hour of prayer right there with us. She wanted coffee. We gave her coffee. I got some food for her. And we just had our meeting. She was there. She prayed with us. And when the time was done, she said, thank you. And she went on her way. Now, as she was leaving, someone says, oh, let me give you some money. And another person said, oh, no, don't give it to her because she might use it for the wrong thing. Sometimes we mean good. And it's not that we are possessed by demons. But sometimes we get in the way of doing good by trying to be good. At that moment, I said, hey, look, if you feel like you want to give her money, give her money. Don't let me or this person stop you. If you want to give her money, give her money. It doesn't matter for what they use it. Obviously, if you have a rule that you never give money and you go buy food, well, go buy food and bring it to her. But at this moment, if something in your heart tells you that you want to give her money, do it. Don't let anybody stop you doing good in the name of God. Don't let anybody stop you from doing good in the name of God. Why? Because sometimes we get in the way and we become demons stopping the good of God. There is, there is something in scriptures that gives us knowledge. But you are not to believe in God because of the amount of knowledge that you have of God. You're not to believe in Christ because you know of him, but because you know him. And you know the difference of that. You're not to believe because you know of doing good. You are to believe because you want to be and do good. False teachings. There is plenty of it out there. I have a particular rule. 
if there is a teaching that I hear that talks about self-preservation, I don't pay as much attention. But if there is a teaching out there that helps me to help someone else, I paid a lot of attention to that one. If you are learning something so that you can teach, pay attention to that. But if you're learning something for your own benefit, be wary of that. If you are looking into self-preservation, that's dangerous. But if you are looking for the preservation of your brother and sister and help, that's wonderful. Obviously, that is my own interpretation of things. Obviously, you are entitled to have your own. But for me, that's what works. If I'm listening to something in YouTube and the thing in YouTube is telling me about me being careful, about how I should be aware of this, and I had, I, I will kindly just click away. But if something is telling me how I should be aware of others because of gifts and talents and how I could be helping the church to be better at somehow, I will pay attention to that. Why? Because I, my, my calling is to live for others because Christ lives for me and dies for me. And since Christ takes care of me, Christ will use me. And that's how I make a distinction between false teachings or not. If I hear a, a preacher telling me about prosperity, about how I could and how I should receive more blessings and God loves me, eh, okay, all right, I, I got you. I got you. God loves me. But I will stop paying attention to that. That's what I normally do. That's how I can tell the difference. When you start paying, paying attention to the last 10 verses of this chapter, verses 6 to 16, you will see how Paul is encouraging Timothy to exercise leadership with servitude. Obviously, one of the most known, known verses here is, don't let anyone think less of you because of your age. This is something that I personally has put up with. A lot of people push me away because they see me. They don't see who I am. They see me. And because I don't dress the part sometimes, I don't dress with the tie and the three-piece suit, but I'm wearing tennis shoes and a baseball cap, they think that I don't know until they find that I do know. And I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe in whatever thing they want. In many ways, this is what happened. I can tell you that my session back at home had a lot of issues with me because I will come to the church in flip-flops and shorts, especially after coming to America. <laughs> back in 1999, after coming to America the first time, and I went to church after, they're like, oh, is that what you learn in America? That you can go to the church in jeans and that you can come in, in shorts and flip-flops? And I'm like, oh, really? Now, let me tell you about the historical Jesus who went to the synagogue without <laughs> underwear. Why? Because there's no underwear. And he will use sandals. And he will write me letters. And I will write back to the session and says, oh, I'm a member of the church. Why? Because I did my catechism class. And you accept me into leadership. And I want to become a member of the session. Oh, you can. Because you're not old enough. Who says that? Oh, they had a, a kicker with me because they like to dish the age. So never, if Christ is telling us through the Apostle Paul that nobody should dish you because of your age, that also applies in the opposite. If you're old and the church is telling you, ah, you don't know anything, you're old. That's the way that we all, no, don't let them do that either. If it works for you being young, don't let them also kick you around when you're old. It, it goes both ways. Don't let anybody dish you out of 
doing something for the church or doing something for someone else because of who you are and your age. It goes both ways. Look, even in baseball, when the ball is thrown out of a strike, you can still hit it. Even if the ball is a foul, even if the ball, even if the ball is a it's a curveball is going outside, if you can reach it, you can hit it. You're not only supposed to be hitting strikes. You can hit anything that comes over the plate. So pay attention to this. Verse 12. Second part. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way that you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity until I get there. Remember that sermon during the summer that the book, um, when the day was telling us how we are the translation of the Bible that perhaps someone might only be able to read? There's people out there who don't want to pay attention to Christ's invitation because of us because of the way that they see Christians behaving. So we have to live our faith. Not only say, don't tell me you're a Christian, show me you're a Christian. And you show it by being a good example. In the personification of good deeds, encouragement, love, in the teaching. Oh, and I love this part. Go ahead, Craig. I understand what you're saying. I think the difficulty comes in sometimes when you see people who um, teach something opposite, but they are really true believers in what they teach. They think that they're doing the right thing, but they are in conflict to what your current thinking is. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's a difficult one. Um, yeah. Um, so what do you do? Fight. Check the scriptures. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. You're, you're right, Dave, but that's where they're coming from. I, I, I'm, I'm going back to my YouTube videos that I watched and in, in getting ready for this. One. And uh, they took bits and pieces, for example, the food part. They took the food part and, and, and viewed it in an Old Testament light and said, that's the right way to look at it. And uh, so th what right. they were doing, they were teaching what they felt was right, but Somebody find somebody find Colossians Colossians two Colossians two Colossians two come on memory Colossians two at the end yes yeah, the end. Somebody what, wants to read person? verse 20, 21, and 22, and 23. I'll do it. All right. You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Bible against Bible is a double-edged sword, my friends. Now, if Christ will tell us, oh, for you to believe in me, you have to go to the highest peak and jump without any rope and swing to the deepest part of the ocean. You will have so many Christians because you are challenging and you're doing and you're earning your way. But since Christ says, hey, look, you only have to believe in me and accept this love that I'm giving you and loving others as you love yourself. Oh, that's too easy. So it must be wrong. So it would be easier for humans to do the difficult thing than the doing the easy thing, which is loving people. Now, if you read just above that, you will also see um, 
verse 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath. All those Christians that hate Halloween, right there for you. These are shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, do you know anybody? Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, because you know Paul was not humble at all. <laughs> and the worship of angels disqualifies you. Such a person also goes in great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by ligaments and sentence groans as God causes to grow. Go back to the question of what do you know is true? What do you know beyond any doubt that it is true? Not only because you have read it in the Bible, but because God has shown you. Now, let's just say that someone gets it really wrong and they believe that and no one teaches them a different way. Let's just say that they try their best and they do something wrong. Do you know what the Good Samaritan law is? That in the event of an accident and you're trained and you do what you think is best and you end up killing that person, no harm will come to you. Because you are trying to do good. The state and the government will see that you try. You had the training. It covers negligence. However, Good Samaritan rule doesn't cover gross negligence, which is knowing that you are doing bad and you continue doing it. The same thing applies to Christianity. There is people who knowing that they're doing evil, they will continue doing evil because of the benefit it gets. I can tell you that that happens, it's happening to Facebook, it happens to the government, and it happens in the church. There are pastors out there that know fully well that they are teaching the wrong thing and they choose to teach the wrong thing because of the benefit they're getting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All these videos that you find on YouTube, they have a percentage of views. So obviously they will tell and they will tell the war stories and the most significant attention grabbing techniques. They will use you to get a benefit. So be wary of that. Obviously listen. But be wary that if people are benefiting from you by you doing something for them, be wary of that. Be wary of that. Now, let me leave you with this. This is my last thought for the day. <clears throat> Verse 16. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. How you live and how you're teaching. Keep reading. No, I am. I am. Oh, okay. But not before stopping there and saying, if you are not teaching, what are you doing? He puts living and teaching as the same token. If you're not teaching, what are you doing? Now, stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who are near you. What you do, how you live, and how you teach are connected to salvation. What you do in this life matters. Everything is taken into account. How you live and how you teach is important for the salvation 
your salvation, but it doesn't stop there, the salvation of those near you. Salvation and other people's salvation. You might have what others might need to approach God with confidence. You might have the example. You might have the teaching that others will pay attention. Here's an invitation. We need volunteers to teach Sunday school for children. We need volunteers to teach Sunday school for youth. For youth. We need volunteers to teach more Bible study for adults. We need volunteers to help in many areas of teaching in the church where you can live by your life. Here's an example. If you decide to teach in youth, you need to know that they don't need to know the most theological advanced tool for interpretation of a text. They don't need you to do an exegesis of the gospels. No, they need to know you and how you experience Christ. That's it. That's it. So the question is how you live, how you teach for your salvation and the salvation of others. Big deal, right? I'm telling you, Paul had took a big hammer and I smash it. So when I acknowledge that I was gonna be a lawyer, but that my job was to teach, I said to myself, you know what? I might as well make teaching my living. Because if that's what I must do, then let me do it. Obviously, I'm not asking all of you to become pastors. However, if you want to, that would be great. I can help you in the process. Don't let anybody stop you because you're old. I'm not. Nobody stopped me when I was young. So, my friends, be encouraged by the words of Paul to Timothy. Be wary of how you live, how you are an example, and how you are teaching know fully well that your church needs teachers now today to god be the glory see you next week amen oh guys. <laughs>